We have been concerned with some of the actions of uh, Venezuelan President Chavez and his understanding of what a democratic system is all about. This is a dangerous uh, enemy to our south, controlling a huge pool of oil that could hurt us very badly. We have the ability to take him out, and I think the time has come that we exercise that ability to get rid of one you know, strong arm dictator. It's a whole lot easier to have some of the covert operatives do the job than get it over with. Why do they want to eliminate Hugo Chavez? We're flying in over the foothills of the Andes into Venezuela to find out why. You know you're approaching Caracas when trees give way to the jumbled slums they call the ranchos. Here houses of the city's poor are stacked on top of each other encircling the luxury high-rises of Venezuela's elite. In 2002, here in the capital, rich and poor met on not too friendly terms. At its simplest, the rich were trying to depose President Chavez, the poor were defending him. They traded bullets in the street, police and National Guard joining in on opposite sides. Some generals sent in armored cars and announced the president had resigned at gunpoint. Chavez was seized and thrown onto a helicopter, which headed ominously out to sea. I didn't know where we were going. I had that sensation, that feeling that I was being taken towards my death. I had a cross in my hand. I was very relaxed. I was ready to die. While the elected president, Chavez, was captive in a helicopter, his kidnappers staged a very strange inaugural ball for their pretend president, Pedro Carmona, head of the Chamber of Commerce. It seemed like it was all over for Chavez. So how did President Hugo miraculously survive? Well, let's go ask the president. It was just two weeks after his kidnapping, but he was in a pretty good mood. Over coffee, he answered my question about his miraculous survival by cryptically quoting the French philosopher Montesquieu. That Montesquieu said that one Montesquieu, Montesquieu, perdón, Montesquieu, gracias, gracias, <laughs> que uno debe that one should ser capaz, be able el leader, to, the leader should be able to, de mirar to see La ola de los acontecimientos. The wave of events coming. Y and to ride it, to ride the wave. I learned that this revolutionary surfer dude survived indeed by seeing the coup d'etat wave in advance. On the night of the coup, at 3 a.m., I reached the head of Venezuela's Air Force on one of the only cell phone lines open in the nation and discovered that while one million citizens marched on the palace to surround the coup leaders on the outside, on the inside, Wave watcher Chavez had secretly hidden commandos inside secret passageways in the palace. The coup leaders were told, bring back Chavez or die. The coup leaders returned the president right to his desk while the public celebrated in the street. But before the coup leaders ran for their lives, a character named Charles Shapiro, the U.S. ambassador, ran down from the U.S. embassy to have his photo taken with the hostage takers. Weirdly, I was able to meet with the man who directed the kidnapping of Hugo Chavez, the wannabe president, Pedro Carmona. I wanted his version of events, and I knew where to find him. He was kept under guard inside his ritzy apartment. Carmona's under house arrest. They're not going to let us bring in the cameras. So we took this film with a high-powered lens from a quarter mile away, and I got in with a hidden tape recorder. When you were arrested, mm -hmm. were you afraid? Where? No, never. Never. Carmona told me about his busy day as self-proclaimed president. He disbanded both the National Assembly and Supreme Court. Not a popular move. <laughs> Carmona berserker. Bandit, they chant. <laughs> and worse, a puppet of Uncle Sam. The United States wants to oust President Chavez from power because they want our oil. Chavez! 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 The United States no, don't have 
the clean hands. To Vistas say the evidence points straight to the U.S. Embassy. Why were American military officers at the base where Chavez was held, and why did Ambassador Shapiro rush down the hill to meet with the coup leaders? When I asked Carmona about the meeting, he was a little coy. Ambassador Shapiro, yes. what did he tell you? Well, he was just collecting information. Just collecting information? President Chavez has a very different view of Uncle Sam's role in the coup d'etat. Yo tengo, por ejemplo, pruebas. Y las tengo por escrito. I have, for example, proof, the written proof. I have the time of the entries and exits of the two military officers from the United States into the headquarters of the coup plotters. Tengo sus nombres. I have their names, who they met with, what they said, proof on video and on still photographs. Chavez, I learned, was warned by the U.S. State Department not to blame the coup on George Bush, but he came close. Y en verdad tengo en mis manos. I have in my hands a radar image of a military vessel that came into Venezuela water on the 13th of April. I have radar images of a helicopter that takes off from that ship and flies over Venezuela and of other planes that violated Venezuela airspace. Por eso el pueblo nunca lo creyó. Ahora a trabajar todo el mundo. Chavez supporters are convinced that the Bush administration is out to overthrow their man. And here, at a May Day rally, they've taken to the streets one million strong to defend him and denounce George Bush. Is Chavez just imagining that Bush was behind the coup? If the Chavistas' reaction to George Bush's involvement in their politics seems a bit paranoid, they actually have much to fear, according to these documents obtained by a U.S. investigator. Eva Gollinger uncovered the evidence that showed that the CIA knew about the 2002 coup in advance. We know five days before the CIA had all the plans, so they were highly elaborated. They knew who was planning the coup. They knew how it was going to happen. They also financed the opposition. They tried to overthrow the government. They backed and financed the coup against President Chavez in April 2002. Yeah, how do you know that? They gave them, because I've been obtaining documents from the U.S. government using the Freedom of Information Act. I've got hard evidence of it. After publishing her State Department documents, she found herself on a list used by right-wing hitmen, and now she lives in hiding. They had put up an article about my new radio program that I have here on a radio station, and people went on there and said, basically, you know, we're making all kinds of threats, and, and someone said, you should be gassed like the Jews were. She complained to the federal prosecutor investigating the coup and the death threats. During the investigation, he was assassinated. So why would the USA entangle itself in a half-baked Latin American coup? We took off from Caracas to find the answer. You want to know what this is all about? Take a look down there. Oil. And lots of it. You can fill your car for eight cents a gallon. This country is one big oil well, once the number one exporter of oil to the USA, bigger than Saudi Arabia, until 1998, when Hugo Chavez won the election. He took the U.S. by surprise when he restored the power of OPEC by slashing Venezuela's oil production. Chavez also doubled the royalties charged on some oil companies. That cheered the poor and the ranchos, but won Chavez the wrath of his own oil workers and the American petroleum industry. Exxon Oil fled the country. The new muscular OPEC was run by Chavez's ally, Ali Rodriguez, once a leftist guerrilla who fought in the Venezuelan mountains. In Caracas, Rodriguez, now foreign minister, explained the mystery of how Chavez knew the coup d'etat wave was about to hit him. It begins with the little understood dependence of the U.S. on Venezuela's vast oil reserves. Of course, the dependence of the United States on oil is increasing progressively. And uh, Venezuela is one of the most important suppliers of the United States. It appears the coup plotters were forced to act before they were ready by their U.S. handlers panicked over the possibility of an oil embargo. The timetable is telling. March 2002, Israel enters Palestinian territory, prompting talk of a new oil boycott by Arab nations against America. Monday, April 8th, Saddam Hussein of Iraq announces an end to oil exports. On Tuesday, Iran and Libya threaten to join. If the boycott went ahead, America would be utterly dependent on Venezuelan oil. Could America allow Chavez to remain in power, in control of America's oil lifeline, 
Ali Rodriguez at OPEC headquarters in Vienna had advanced notice of the oil producers' moves. Our BBC team learned that Rodriguez called Chavez with a warning that a coup was imminent. Did the president understand your warning? Yes, of course, but uh, the problem with this kind of uh, activities is that are very secret and only a little group of uh, people know of the plans. Chavez confirmed the warning, so when the coup rushed ahead, Chavez was prepared. Yes, it was a call of alert to decrease those possible risks. That call helped me. Chavez instructed his oil minister to issue a statement saying that Venezuela would not join an embargo, but it was too late. In the aftermath of the coup, militant Chavistas demanded rough justice for Carmona's crew, but Venezuela has returned to its older, gentlemanly ways. The National Assembly is investigating the coup. It's quite light in here, considering that just days ago, these guys were pointing guns at each other. Inside, Carmona, coup leader, had been summoned from house arrest by the National Assembly. He insisted his bungled ousting of Chavez wasn't really a coup. The Assembly wants to know about American involvement. Later, Chavez deliberately let Carmona escape to Colombia. The, the Assembly is also investigating why TV stations such as RCTV twisted coverage to aid the coup plotters. Another media mogul under suspicion is Gustavo Cisneros. While the coup was in progress, Cisneros met with Bush's man in charge of Latin America, Otto Reich. Propaganda is Reich's forte. He's infamous for his role in the illegal funding of Contra terrorists who try to overthrow Nicaragua's government. The U.S. Comptroller General reported that Reich's office had, quote, engaged in prohibited covert propaganda activities. Chavez is a killer! Chavez is a killer! Let's go! Chavez! You may have failed, but the opposition hasn't given up. In Venezuela, even the bankers take to the streets. There's whispers of another coup. The rich, outnumbered by the poor, have little faith in electoral democracy. Why not wait for the next election to remove him? Because it's too much time. We have been two years in jail, and we want to change the things. We can't wait until the new elections. They want a coup, not elections. What are they so unhappy about? The answer is here, where the march ended, in this shopping district on the Park Avenue of Caracas, surrounded by upscale malls like this. The oil has made Venezuela's rich even richer, but Chavez, for the first time, has imposed an income tax on these shoppers. Worse, this once tax-free elite of Venezuela, almost all of them very white, have lost their political privileges to poor Venezuelans who, like Chavez, proudly call themselves black and Indian. Because the dark and poor so outnumber the pale-skinned shoppers, anti-Chavez candidates have a very lonely road to drive. Julio Borges was the leading candidate for the presidency against Chavez. In 2006, we rode along in his air-conditioned SUV while he pitched his complaints about Chavez to the gentle sounds of Haydn. We ended up in this rural village, hours from the high-rises of Caracas, where Borges expected to greet a rally of his supporters. He found one, who invited us into her home for arepas. Ah. Mucho gusto. Ah, but es muy bello. Que usted, tú eres muy bonito. Uh, beautiful, you are beautiful. Oh, thank you. Gracias, gracias. That's, that's, that's the limit of my Spanish. Uh. As far as she's concerned, Chavez has the people fooled. We don't want dictators, she says. They hand out food baskets, but it's a trick. Mmm, rico. <laughs> we returned to the very same village the next day, where Borges' opponent appeared. The reaction was slightly different. Buenos dias a toda Venezuela. This is the variety show host, revolutionary, and president of Venezuela, the inimitable Hugo Chavez, presenting his live six-hour-long weekly television spectacular. 
Every Sunday, he flies his desk to a new location to perform for his thousands of screaming fans and voters. To George Bush, he's a demagogue awash in oil money. To this audience, he's a hero, savior. And wannabe Frank Sinatra. Welcome to the latest edition of South American Idol. Why are these people treating Chavez like Elvis gone Latin? It's not just the oil money from American drivers, it's how Chavez has spent these oil riches. Let's go see what the money from the gringos in their SUVs bought. In barrios like this, there's a happy bounce. Chavez has finally tackled the health and education problems suffered by Venezuela's poor. He's imported 15,000 Cuban doctors and teachers, too. Before Chavez spread the oil wealth, 55% of the population lived in poverty. Now poverty is down by a third, and a million and a half people have been taught to read. In this building, we found a new Cuban clinic, and I ran into a resident who had picked up English while working in Trinidad. We are the only country on this planet that has so much, or have so many changes in the social aspect. Medical attention, free, we can never get free operations, x-rays, medicines, or education also. People who never knew how to write, read and write, mm -hmm. now know how to sign their own papers and everything. This is Arturo Quiran. He invited me upstairs for a cold one. Chavez, he says, has changed the way the oil money is handled. 10, 15 years ago, Carlo Andre Perez, there was a lot of oil money here in Venezuela. The oil boom, we call it. Okay, here in Venezuela, there was a lot of money entering the country. But we didn't see it. When our BBC team was here in 2002, people weren't so happy. A coup and a strike by oil company managers left the economy in ruins, and Chavez's long-term survival in doubt. But then... A cowboy rode out of the north and saved Hugo Chavez. In 2003, George Bush invaded Iraq, and when mission accomplished became mission impossible, oil prices tripled. The explosion in the price of oil dumped $50 billion into Hugo Chavez's lap, most of that from the United States. But it's not only Venezuela's poor who are enjoying Hugo Chavez's oil-pumped largesse. Everyone on the continent is trying to jump into Santa Hugo's sleigh. Hugo Chavez has called all the bankers of Latin America together, and when Chavez speaks, they listen. The financiers were treated to a history of Venezuela's central bank in song, and the continent's central bankers were happy to hum along. Chavez has handed out billions to their treasuries. He's spending way more than George Bush in Latin America. And here's the man who actually writes the checks, Chavez's central banker, a very popular guy. In fact, Chavez wants to completely eliminate the International Monetary Fund and replace it with an International Humanitarian Fund. I caught up with Mr. Checkbook. Can, can I get one more check, too? You're giving out checks to all these countries. Can I get a check? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. See you. Okay. Ecuador got a quarter billion. Brazil got four billion. Argentina got four billion. No wonder these guys showed up. Chavez is giving money to the poor of his nation and our allies in Latin America. He's won half a dozen elections since 1998, has no secret prisons, and he hasn't invaded anyone. And he's more than happy to sell us all the oil we want. So why is it that George Bush and his friends cannot wait for the opportunity to eliminate the president of Venezuela? We have the ability to take him out, and I think the time has come that we exercise that ability. We don't need another $200 billion war uh, to get rid of one you know, strong-arm dictator. It's a whole lot easier to have some of the covert operatives do the job and then get it over with. What's their problem with Hugo Chavez? Maybe this is the key. According to an internal study we got our hands on from inside the U.S. Department of Energy, the next oil kingdoms, if the price of oil stays high, will be Canada, Canada, and Venezuela. Now, according to this U.S. Department of Energy document, which they'd rather you not see, the 
world supply of liquid petroleum is running out unless you add in this huge pile of oil from Venezuela, which has extra heavy oil in place of 1.36 trillion barrels. Now that's five times as much as the entire reserve in Saudi Arabia. The thing is, Venezuela's oil is really expensive to pull up. The price of oil has to stay at $50 a barrel or higher for three decades for anyone to invest to pull up this extra heavy oil. Think that can't happen? Ten years ago, the price of oil was only 10 bucks a barrel. Now, if the price of oil stays above $50 a barrel, then Hugo Chavez and Venezuela, not Saudi Arabia, control OPEC and the world's supply of oil. I showed Chavez the Department of Energy's surprising internal analysis of Venezuela's true oil riches. He wasn't surprised. Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world. In the future, Venezuela won't have any more oil, it is true. But that's in the 22nd century. Venezuela has oil for 200 years. Then Chavez made an extraordinary offer through our BBC broadcast. He would give the world unlimited oil at just $50 a barrel, one-third off the price set by OPEC. We're trying to find an equilibrium. The price of oil could remain at the low level of $50. That's a fair price. It's not a high price. Had Hugo Chavez gone completely loco, giving away billions of dollars of his nation's resources? Not at all. By giving up a short-term windfall in return for a long-term minimum price, Chavez would become the Abdullah of the Americas, king of the world's oil. This is what the world's currently declared oil reserves look like with most of the oil in the Middle East, especially Saudi Arabia. But at $50 a barrel, it becomes economic to exploit the world's vast undeclared reserves of heavy tar oil. And the picture changes radically. So the question is, why didn't George Bush, after watching our broadcast, rush right down to Venezuela, kiss Hugo Chavez on both cheeks, and accept his generous offer of oil at only 50 bucks a barrel? I think the answer could be right here. The reserves of the five largest oil majors have grown by $2.36 trillion since George Bush took office. Oil company profits have risen by 353%. Oil companies don't make their profits from stability, but from instability, shocks, mayhem, war, threats of war, coup d'etats, threats of coup d'etat, threats of assassination, and assassinations are very profitable indeed. Is Hugo Chavez worried? Chavez showed me the sword of Simón Bolívar, the man who liberated South America from Spanish imperialism. The President of the United States may dismiss him as a demagogue and show-off, but for Bush, the show may be over once Chavez is crowned king of oil. Thank you very much. Good luck. Cuando yo quiera devolver, no serás tú quien lo decida.